Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 161 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. And we wanted to give a big thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Sarah. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you and all of our other Patreons. We couldn't do it without you. Absolutely. We couldn't at this point (laughs) because the contributions help pay for the editing that we need because of my boo-boo on my wrist. And we're just so grateful. So thank you all. We really appreciate it. And also congratulations to Mimi in Illinois, winner of a copy of The Seed Keeper, our upcoming third quarter read along. Mimi reports that she has been a listener since the beginning of time. So thank you, Mimi. That's awesome. Another Illini. Yes, that's right. That's probably why she listens. (laughs) For those of you who don't know, I'm originally from Illinois. So, you know. If you can't tell by her Illinois accent. (laughs) (laughs) And the Zoom conversation for the Seed Keeper will take place on Sunday evening, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, September 18th. Yeah. And if you'd like to join us, just shoot us an email, bookcougars at gmail.com. And that will save your spot. We'd love to have you join us. We would. And on our bookshop.org page, we have a list of all of our read along books and you can purchase the Seed Keepers through Bookshop, which helps the Cougars and independent bookstores. Milkweed Editions, who is the publisher of the Seed Keeper, gave us this copy to give away. Thank you. Gave us a coupon code. If you purchase directly from them, you can use the coupon code SeedKeeperCougars, all one word, for free shipping. You do have to buy a copy of the Seed Keeper to get the free shipping, but then you can add anything else from their catalog to your cart and receive free shipping on that. Yeah. And they have such a great catalog. We hope you take the time to browse it. Oh, it's really amazing. I love their books and I love their covers. I mean, I love everything about the books they put out. Yeah. So beautiful. And Chris has some burning news. Yeah. A burning follow-up that was reignited by a text that Shuli sent us over the weekend saying that she was watching Frasier. Remember that old TV show and Frasier's dad said, my dogs are barking. (laughs) And Shuli cracked up and texted us about that. So it's like, great, you know, so I, I say things that old men who in the 1990s said, but um, (laughs) so way back when this whole issue of my dogs are barking first came up, I had done a little research into where the phrase originated and it's attributed to a man named Thomas Tad Dorgan. His dates were 1877 to 1929. He was a cartoonist who popularized or created a lot of phrases, things like dumbbell for crying out loud, hard boiled. I was really fascinated by that. So he's the one who equated dogs with shoes. And so my dogs are barking, meaning my feet are sore. While I had been looking at that, I came across a really intriguing tidbit about hush puppy shoes. Anybody remember hush puppies? I remember I wore them when I was a kid. So the story behind that is they were not going to be named Hush Puppies originally, but the sales manager for the company, a Jim Muir was his name. He was down south visiting a friend and they were eating Hush Puppies, you know, those deep fried cornmeal things. One of my favorite foods that there is. I love (laughs) Hush Puppies. Yes. So he was intrigued by the name and the, you know, the friend told him that they were originally given to things that were fried up and tossed at the dogs to keep them from barking. Mm. So hush puppies. And then he was thinking, my dogs are barking, hush puppies. It just kind of clicked. So that is how hush puppies came to be. And now we know that it was Tad Dorgan who originated the term, my dogs are barking. Thank you, Chris. Researcher extraordinaire. (laughs) And now I want to eat some hush puppies. Thanks for that. I know, right? (laughs) Hush puppies with some good Carolina barbecue. Oh my gosh. Mm. I, I think it's weird if I could just go on a quick tangent here that we here in Guilford and in Connecticut and in on the East Coast, we have a lot of delicious seafood and they often, you know, fry seafood. And that's when you're down south. If you get some fried seafood, you get hush puppies. It's always a side choice. Here, there's no such thing. Yeah. It's all about the fries, which, you know, is not a bad choice. Yeah, fries or onion rings maybe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, even when you get a big old thing of fried clams, it's yeah. no hush, oh, puppies. hush puppies would be 
perfect with that. Yeah. I'm going to start a movement. You should. Yeah. I'm behind you. Okay. I'll back you. Will you stand on a street corner with me I with will. some signs? With a sandwich board. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. So, Chris, what are you currently reading? Well, I have to admit, I'm currently in a little bit of a, I can't call it a reading slump. It's not that, but it's a bit of a book hangover, uh, mm. for lack of a better word. Um, but I am still reading, although it's been a couple days, Other Terrors, that inclusive anthology that was edited by Vince Laguno and Rena Mason, who we had on episode 160 fantastic anthology. So I've been picking it up every couple days and enjoying that. And then I'm still listening to Atomic Anna by by Rachel Rachel Barenbaum, whose interview is at the end of this episode. We look forward to sharing that with you all. So what caused your book hanger for, do you want to talk about that later? It was the East of Eden. Oh yeah. I'll talk about that later. I think we both will. Yes. Yeah. What are you currently reading? I'm reading Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. This is a book cover that if you've seen it, you can't forget it. It's bright orange. It has a woman's face on the cover with a pencil coming out of her hair. It's just been really intriguing to me. And then I just started seeing people reviewing and reviewing and loving it. I put it on hold in the library and it finally came up for me digitally. So I started it last night and I love it. It takes place in the 50s and 60s. It's about Calvin and Elizabeth. They're both chemists. But somehow Elizabeth ends up being the host of a cooking show. Hmm. Yeah, that's all I really know. I'm not that deep into it. But the writing has a fast clip to it and is funny. So it's the perfect book for me because I too, until you just said it just now, I didn't realize I've been having a little hard time getting hooked on something new. So this one is working. Again, that's called Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. So let's jump right into Just Read. What have you just read? The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Rafi. Oh, I loved this book so much. First of all, it wins best cover. Such a beautiful cover. Thank you to Knopf Publishing for sending me this copy. This book came out in England in 2020. It won the Costa Book Award. It just published here in the States mid-July this year. It's won a bunch of other stuff. I don't know, but I know that it won the Costa. This book is about a fictional Caribbean island called Black Conch. And I'm going to read you the epigraph, the quote at the beginning. A stranger to tears, she did not weep. A stranger to clothes, she did not dress. They pocked her with cigarette ends and with burnt corks and rolled on the tavern floor in raucous laughter. Pablo Neruda, Fable of the Mermaid and the Drunks. Wow. So that kind of sets the stage for the very beginning of the book, which is quite traumatic. It's two white men and some black island sailors are on a ship or not a ship, I shouldn't say that, it's a boat, fishing boat, and they're going after this mermaid. They've caught her in their hooks. They went out to go fishing, but they caught a mermaid. She's trying desperately to get away, but she tires eventually after hours battling them, and they take her on board and capture her and tie her up, and the black sailors don't feel good about it at all, almost like karmically, like this is not a good thing. We don't know much about mermaids, but we know it's probably not good to capture one. Whereas the white men, they've taken her on as a prize and they're going to try to sell her for as much money as they can. Mm. A local black sailor named David comes upon her and takes her down and rescues her while the white sailors are in a bar celebrating and getting drunk. There's a lot of magic realism, obviously, because it's about mermaids, but it's also a story about love and what the white people have done to island culture. Both white people like the example of these sailors, but also people who have lived there and own quite a bit of property and what their role is on the island. And then also how this woman came to become a mermaid, which had a lot to do with female hatred against other females, which is always there and a terrible theme. It's one that I don't have much patience for, but hear about often. Tough opening scene, some tough 
subject matter, but the way the story is told is in journal entries by David, the sailor who rescues the mermaid, by some poetry written from the point of view of the mermaid, Mm -hmm. and then regular prose writing. I just thought the way that the book was put together was fascinating, beautifully written, quick read. I loved it. Wow. That sounds really intense. And I know when you posted about it on social media, a lot of people jumped in and said that it's one of their favorites or that they can't wait to read it. Right. One of the people who said it was one of their favorites of the year was Ann Kingman, host of the prior books on the nightstand. So it was fun to see her pipe in about that. And then Maggie O'Farrell, who's the author of Hamnet, blurbed it saying a daring mesmerizing novel single-handedly bringing magic realism up to date so i love that quote so again this book is called the mermaid of black conch by monique rafi highly recommend maybe that was part of my book hangover too yeah that sounds like a really intense kind of exhausting Mm -hmm. struggle of a book you know yeah or struggle in the book Yeah. yeah yeah Well, I'll go ahead and start talking about East of Eden by John Steinbeck, which was the book club pick for the Vintage Book Club. And both of us went and attended the book club and had a really wonderful conversation with everyone. It was my first reading of the novel. Yeah, and I didn't get to reread it. I bit off more than I could chew, but I did get my copy out and look at it. And I reread the Spark Notes, actually, which was really helpful just to remind me of all the characters and some of the symbolism, et cetera. Yeah, because it's a big book. It's 602 pages or so. So hashtag big book summer for Mm -hmm. Sue. But I had no idea really what the book was about. I knew it was based on the biblical retelling of Genesis and the Adam and Eve story and then Cain and Abel. I know that those were two big parts of it. But I didn't know that it was also part memoir and part history and then part fiction. And I loved it. It was really epic in a lot of ways. It starts before the Civil War. The dad of Adam and Charles is a soldier during the Civil War. They are two of the main characters initially, and Adam is one of the characters throughout. It starts in Connecticut, and then they're in Salinas in California, where is considered Steinbeck country now. Steinbeck tells the story of his family in part and another family from the area. And he goes into like the geologic history of the area. So a couple book club members said that some of the landscape writing made them think of Cather and just how both writers placed people in the landscape and talked about the landscape and its impact on people and how people work the land and things like that. Or didn't, in the case of Samuel, right? who's another great character, who I'd heard that was based on Steinbeck's grandfather, Samuel. And reminder that this book club used to be the Cather, well, a Cather book club, which is why people were making comparison to Cather and Steinbeck's writing. Right. Thank you for saying that. We're the vintage book club now, and we'll be doing... <laughs> Steinbeck for the next 12 months. Right. Yeah, I loved it. The character of Kathy, Kate, you should totally (laughs) read it because it's one of those books you really need to talk about, I think, after you read it because it's so rich and it's so complex. Like the character of Kathy, is she realistic? Is she not? I think she's a problematic one because I really think in what I have read from Steinbeck, I don't think he does women all that well. Mm. They're usually not as well-rounded or as in-depth as the male characters. Mm. I don't know. I'm not a Steinbeck I'm Trying to remember aficionado. when we read Grapes of Wrath, if I had any feelings about that, but I don't remember. Well, I remember a couple of things from the Grapes of Wrath, but I always remember Rose of Sharon <laughs> from the movie. We <laughs> yes. also watched the movie, and we have Rose of Sharon bushes or trees. I know people consider them trees. Some people consider them bushes. Right. We have them in our neighborhood. So every time they bloom, that's what I hear in my mind. <laughs> Rose of Sharon. <laughs> and someone at book club did tell us, or maybe you knew this already. I didn't know that there is an East of Eden, not a movie. It was like serialized. Oh right? yeah. And I think it was 1981. There was a made for TV serialization mm-hmm. series of it. Yeah. Yeah. And who was it? Jane Seymour is in it. I think she's Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't really picture that. And then, of course, there's the classic movie adaptation from the 40s or 50s. I'm sorry, 50s, 
with James Dean playing right. Cal. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't watch that. I watched some clips of the movie. It seemed a little overwrought for right. my emotional state at the time. <laughs> so I might catch that later. But I was really blown away by East of Eden. I'm so glad you read it. Listeners might remember that this is in my top 10 of all time. And I didn't realize that was stressing Chris out when she was reading it. It's like, <laughs> what do you do if you read one of your book buddies favorite books of all time and you don't like it? Right. So I want to tell you it's fine if you had not liked it, but I'm thrilled that you liked it. <laughs> yeah, I am too. Well, you know, it's just like, I know that you know that every book is not for every person, but um, yeah, you know, I had a little weight about that. So I'm really glad I loved it. I can see reading it again in the not too distant future because it is so rich mm -hmm. and he just really takes you into th these people's lives mm -hmm. in a way that it's it's mythic. There is that biblical mythological quality to it but there's also a lot of realism one of my favorite parts was when they get an automobile they buy a ford and the salesman who delivers it drops it off and then he doesn't even want to attempt to really get it started and he says i'll send a mechanic tomorrow to teach you how to start the car so then the next day the mechanic comes who's this kind of smart alecky young guy He's like, didn't you read the manual? You know, there's a manual under the front seat. You don't think about what it's like for the first people who drove cars, like what they had to go through. Right. I mean, I've seen enough movies to like know that people broke their arms on right. the crank and things like that. <laughs> but um, that was a really cool inclusion, I thought, that is a moment in time that most of us, we sit in a car and we turn it on. Don't think about that. So, yeah, yeah, we don't. Unless it's one of those keyless cars, then you're like, wait, what do I have to do? Right. I have to... <laughs> Step on the brake and push hit, a button. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> seems like I'm in, now I'm in a like spaceship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, highly recommend East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I know you highly recommend it. For those of you who are interested in what our next selections are from Steinbeck, and yes, that was selections plural. <laughs> We all got a little bit enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. I think we were emboldened by reading a 602 page novel. That our next meeting, we are going to be discussing two Steinbeck novels, two short ones, Cannery Row and then Sweet Thursday. Which I'd never heard of. I hadn't either. And it's like Cannery Row number one and number two. I mean, they go together. They do. Yeah. Same characters, same location, I guess. But Cannery Row came out in 1945 and it's 181 pages. And then Sweet Thursday was published in 1954 and that was 249 pages. So this is like, you know, teeny tiny novel. Yeah, now we're reading 500 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that our, our next meeting for the Vintage Book Club is October 20th at the Wood Memorial Library and Museum in South Windsor, Connecticut at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. For those of you in the area who'd like to join us, it's open to the public. We'd love for you to join us. Please do. Well, I also read Atomic Anna. I won't talk about it too much because we have a fantastic conversation with Rachel coming up at the end of this episode. But just to give you a brief synopsis, it is about three generations of women trying to change history and prevent one of the greatest nuclear disasters of all time, Chernobyl. These three different women, it's told from their point of view. Anna Burkova is a renowned nuclear scientist Living in the Soviet Union, Molly is her daughter coming of age in the 60s in America, and Raisa is growing up in the 1980s, and she is Molly's daughter and the granddaughter of Anna. And it's kind of the whole book is a race against time and also about the bending of time and traveling through time. Such a good book. I loved it. I listened to it both on audio and read the print and literally could not, like I thought of any excuse <laughs> to keep going. So again, that's Atomic Anna by Rachel Barenbaum. And please stay on for the conversation we have with Rachel at the end. Well, as I said, you know, East of Eden wiped me out for a little bit. I had planned on immediately reading John Steinbeck's Journal of a Novel which is the East of Eden letters that he had written while he was writing the novel. But I just couldn't like, I was like, well, my brain needs to let the story bounce around a little bit more before that. So I have it. That's going to be a future thing. So then I didn't read for a couple of days. Really. I just, you know, 
didn't. I might have flipped through some things. Nothing was really sticking. And then one day I woke up and I said, okay, I want to read something. I was looking for something short. So I picked up Bear by Marion Engel. Wow. Amazing book. Amazing novel. You know, it was published in 1976 and it won the Governor General's Literary Award, which is one of Canada's top literary awards. Engel was a Canadian. She's passed away since. I thought it was interesting looking at who the judges were for that year, because, you know, we've talked about judges and awards and so much of it does depend on who the, the judges are. So that year for that category, it was Margaret Lawrence, Alice Monroe, and Mordecai Richler. I was like, wow, what a crew. So Bear was Engel's fifth novel, and it is about a woman who is an archivist slash librarian working in this historical society in a city. It's towards the end of winter, and she's been pretty much just going from her apartment to work, maybe the grocery store, smoking a ton. So she's been living like a mole, I think, is what is said about her. It's a historical society that's not exactly a premier institution, so they don't get a lot of really great collections. It's usually people bringing in like old family pictures or some old map, thing like that. And they surprisingly were gifted this man's estate, a very important personage. And he has this wonderful estate that's further north in Ontario, his home that he built up there with this exquisite library. They won that. I guess there was a legal battle So it's the biggest collection they've ever been given. So the boss sends her up there to assess it and catalog it and document the library and the house as a whole. So she goes up there and, you know, it's one of those you can tell, like here she is living like a mole, wintertime. She's coming out of like her own hibernation, heading north into the country, into the wilderness in a lot of ways. And the estate is on an island And it's an octagonal home. I love those. So she starts checking out the library. First of all, she has to take a boat to get there. So she needs a local guide to kind of take her there and get her set up. And oh, by the way, there's a bear here. A bear that is like a pet, but still wild. It gets chained into its own little house. So please take care of the bear. And I should say that the woman, her name is Lou. She's 27 years old. She's a white woman. There is a First Nations old woman who also had looked after the bear for the longest time. Lucy's her name. She tells Lou to take a poop next to the bear every morning and they'll get along just fine because he needs to smell her feces, I guess, to bond. So wow, she does that and they start bonding and she's assessing the library, going through all these books. You know, they're 19th century. Some of them are rare. Others are pretty standard for that time period. And one day the bear walks into the house and walks up the stairs and plops down next to the fireplace as if, you know, she says he knows where he's going. And so the big thing about the book is they have sex or the woman has sex with the bear. So that's controversial. And doing a little research, Engel had written this book as part of a collection that was never published of, quote, pornographic stories. That's what they were going to be to raise money for an organization that she had started called the Writers Union of Canada. The whole collection never got published, but she expanded the story and kept writing about it. And so that was controversial, you know, a woman having relations with a bear in Western culture. It would be considered bestiality and a sin and all that. But in part, Engel was inspired by some First Nations stories of the princess bear or the mother bear, where I think it might be common knowledge that in a lot of First Nations or Native American indigenous stories, there's more interaction with humans and animals, and there are relationships, sexual or not, that are not considered bestiality. It's much more fluid Mm -hmm. because they're spirits in different shapes and whatnot. So Engel was in part motivated by some of those mythological stories. And so when she's looking at these books, slips of paper come out of a lot of them that notate a lot of mythological stories about bears from around the world, really, and how special bears are. 
So you have to keep that in mind too. It's not like one day she's just like, Ooh, bear, let's do it. <laughs> you know, like she's, <laughs> she's reading all of this fantastic but mythological. She's being turned on by the idea of bear. In a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I found this lovely interview with Engel, a TV interview that was done. Oh my gosh. I don't remember what year it might've been like in 81, late seventies. Mm. And she basically says like one of the reasons she wrote it was that she's sick of Canadian nature writing that writes animals as if they're humans with human sensibilities and human characteristics. So she wanted to in part get away from that. And the bear has no thoughts that we're aware of. Everything we know about the bear is people putting their stuff on the bear. So long story short, Lou, the protagonist, has this massive awakening. And towards the end, she and this is spoilery, I guess, but she has an awakening and her life changes. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. not too spoilery, I suppose. It's but like it's like the awakening, the story, the awakening, you know, but with many different characteristics. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's you know, it's beautiful writing and it's short. It's a short book. It's just a little bit, it's like a hundred and sixty something pages. Very short, but there is so much nature in it. There is so much about a woman being intellectual and also erotic for herself. She masturbates. One of the points in the book that's made is she doesn't mind men and their sexuality. The problem is that they don't think women have their own erotic needs. And yeah, so the 70s were wild in a lot of ways. It was a sexual revolution time. I could probably do a ton of research about this book because there have been so many different reactions about it, obviously. But it's a beautifully written book and weird. <laughs> So there's the nature aspect, there's the history, who writes it, how it gets written and why. There's the colonialism aspect, the First Nations people, how the land has now become not a sacred space, but it's become real estate because it's on an island up north. And so summer people come with their boats and their guns and all that. Hmm. I mean, it's got some crossover. It's interesting with the mermaid of Black Conch. It's really interesting because there are some of those similar themes. Mm, yeah, interesting. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. And it's one of those books that if you know it's about a woman who eventually has sex with a bear, you're reading for that because you're just like, what? Like, mm -hmm. I look forward to rereading it to focus more on just the writing itself because yeah. it's beautiful and it's very complex for being a short novel. It sounds like it. Yeah. 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 So again, that was Bear by Marion Engel. It is called, like, you're the best Canadian novel of all time. Wow. The National Post. Huh. Yeah. So one more thing. I started a, a series. Uh, this is just yesterday. You know, I've been reading picture books this year. And so I was looking at books that are coming out. And there's one called Just Like Home that's coming out August 31st by Sarah Gailey. And this is a, a gothic novel story about a woman who's coming home to take care of her mom in the house before she passes. And the dad had been a serial killer, like a very and studied kind of serial killer. And I guess they have a guest home and people come who are doing research to be inspired to be there. So she's dealing with all of this. I thought that sounded really fascinating. So then it just happened that I looked at other stuff that Sarah Gailey has written and she did a series um, of Buffy the Vampire Slayer graphic novels. So she was the writer for these, and Michael Shelter was the, the pencilist, and then other people did the coloring and the text and things like that. But it's um, a series of graphic novels, and I've read the first three. The fourth one just came out today, so that is now downloaded on my iPad. The gist of it is... Buffy is no longer the Slayer, Willow is the Slayer. And so throughout these different comic length graphic novels, you find out why Willow is now the Slayer. And some of it has to do with trauma that they try to help Buffy with all these horrific memories that she has and how what they did is problematic. And the whole gang is there, Giles. The mentor librarian is there. Xander is also a character. Faith, one of the other hunters from the Buffyverse, is there as well. So will these make sense to you if you, like, I've never once watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Will they make sense to you if you haven't? Yeah, I don't know if people who don't know the Buffy 
original Buffy would be interested. I'm not really sure. So did you read Buffy the Vampire books or did you just watch the show? I watched the show. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I in the past I've read a couple graphic novels when I worked in the bookstore. You know, it's something you could grab and read at lunchtime, mm-hmm. that type of thing. But I never really got into them. So I had the book Hangover from East of Eden, and then I got Bear, and then that kind of blew my mind a little bit too. So I thought, well, I'm going to go looking around and seeing what's coming out, which again just led me to this Vampire Slayer series. Although in the first episode, it's a giant crab. In this graphic novel? Yes. Oh, It's a giant weird. crab that is mm-hmm. the monster, hmm. which I thought was an interesting choice. But it made sense when you read the second one. And I'll just stop talking right now. So again, that is the Vampire Slayer graphic novel series by Sarah Gailey and Michael Shelter. Awesome. (laughs) So Emily, Biblio Adventures. I had a great in-person Biblio Adventure at a bookstore. I went just down the road to RJ Julia's in Madison and saw Gabrielle Zevin, the author of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, the novel that I talked about on episode 160. She was fantastic. So smart, which did not surprise me at all, but also very funny. This book is her 10th novel, which I didn't realize that she'd written so many books. Well, first of all, she started out by saying, I've done some events with a companion in conversation events, but she said, I'm noticing that since it's summer, oftentimes I show up thinking I'm going to be in conversation and then my in conversation person doesn't show up. I don't know if that's because it's summer or scheduling snafus. So this time I decided to just do it myself. And I've been doing this long enough that I'm pretty sure I know the questions you guys want me to answer. So she was really great. And she literally had written herself like a set of questions. One of the things that I thought was really interesting that she talked about is that This book is over 400 pages. She said she actually thinks it's over 500 pages, but they squished it in to make it 400 pages. So she said, if you feel like it's really dense, it is, Mm -hmm. you know, each page is very dense, but she kind of felt that the large book is something that people think of as the male writer's domain. And she really wanted to tackle a large book herself. And that was part of her goal when she sat down to write. The other thing she talked about, because there is seemingly this trend right now of books coming out that are either the pandemic is a character in the story or there's some traveling in the story. So it's either like author's were stuck where they were, which they were, you know, during the pandemic, or they took the opportunity to write and fantasize about being somewhere else. And that's the tact she took, which is why she said, you know, the book goes from coast to coast. They're in the Cambridge, Boston, Massachusetts area, and then they're in California area. So I thought that was a really interesting. She also said that now that she's had some success, there's a lot more pressure when you go to put out a book. And there was something about the pandemic that she felt like because the world shut down, it almost felt to her like how she felt when she was writing her first novel and there were no expectations. Wow. And she found it very freeing experience. I just thought that was so interesting. Also, just to hear how some authors felt like they couldn't write at all. You know, they Mm -hmm. had the opposite. They felt the world was ending and they were stuck and they couldn't write. But for her, it was like this freeing experience because all her places she needed to be and expectations disappeared. Oh, the other thing, this book has a real video game theme in it. And she said one of the things that she likes about that theme is that with video games, kind of every day is a new day and you get to start over again. And she wanted to explore that theme. And she also wanted to explore the theme of love people who are in love but not married, because one of the things that authors are tasked to do when they have a novel coming out is their publicist or their agent or the publishing company, I'm not sure which, ask them to start writing essays and, you know, get their name out there so people know they have a new book coming out. And she's very ambivalent about it. She's very private. I can't remember which book it was before, but she was hounded so much that she ended up writing an essay that in modern love in the New York times, that was about how to be in love is to not be married. 
because she and her partner are not married. And there was a huge backlash when she wrote the piece. So she was like, you know, it taught her a lesson, like, I don't want to write essays. But she said there was such a backlash about it. And she feels so strongly about people can be married, people can not be married, people can have kids, people can not have kids. But, you know, there's all different kinds of love. And that's another theme that is explored in this book, because the two main protagonists are in love with each other, but it's not a marriage kind of love. Mm -hmm. It's not a romantic love. Mm -hmm. And so it was really interesting to hear her talk about some of, you know, her own personal experience with that and how it came into the book. But if you get a chance to see her, as a matter of fact, it's on the RJ Julia YouTube channel. I will put a link in the show notes if you want to watch it. She was also recently on an Instagram live with Emma Straub at Books Are Magic. So you could find that. She's out on tour right now. And I really recommend that you get a chance to see her again. That's Gabrielle Zevin, the author of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Nice. That's awesome. I caught an interview with her. I think it might have been like the New York Times book review podcast. I'm not 100%, but yeah, she sounds really cool and yeah. really one of those people who likes to think about things yes. differently for sure. Yeah. What about you? Yes. Well, I forgot to mention on the last episode when I was talking about Biblio Adventures from when I was in Illinois, one day mom and I, we were driving around and we stopped at the Brookfield Public Library. I don't even know why we we're in that neighborhood, but that's where Laura and I lived the last place before we moved to Connecticut. And just before we were leaving, they were starting to talk about plans for a new addition, a new library in itself. And it's happened. I didn't keep in touch with them when we moved. So driving down the street, I was like, holy crap, I have to stop, I have to check it out. So that was fun to see. It's very modern looking. I kind of like traditional looking libraries, but I'm, I can also see the appeal to the newer modern looking library and the super friendly staff. Some of the faces I remembered, some new folks and really nice space. They have the different sections for like children and then for teens and nice study rooms, all that good stuff. Across the street, it's in one of those intersections where it's kind of like six streets come and they meet in the middle, but they don't have like a rotary or anything there. So you kind of have to stop and pay attention. And so they're like little wedge shaped sections. And there was a house across the street that Laura and I had actually looked at when we were first moving to the area. That house is gone. It's now the parking lot. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did they take the old building down? Yes, okay. the old building is gone. Okay. And um, it's a completely new place. They have outdoor seating as well, which is really nice. So if you had stayed there, you would have been libraryless for a little bit. Yes. Well, you know what? They closed it at one point. We lived in Brookfield for nine years, I think. At one point, they had closed for some renovation. And so they were moving a lot of things. And they put out a call saying, come and check out as much as you can books, DVDs, everything. We want as much gone so we don't have to physically move the stuff. Wow. So I took out like bags and bags of stuff and, you know, we had it for like months. Right. I could um, see you walking home and Laura's yes. like, oh, great. So yes. glad they asked. The problem was keeping it all in one space because I thought, oh man, if I don't and stuff starts wandering yes. around, I'll never find right. it, you know? So yeah, I don't know the details of how long they were closed, but they just opened, um, last summer I think it was Perfect. yeah nice. so that was cool to see nice so I told you I had competing events but I did get to catch most of the buzz books romance panel that was sponsored with editors and their romance novelists which was really fun so it was five different authors with their editors and I'm just gonna call out the authors and the name of the book that they have coming out all of these are coming out within the next year and I'll put their release dates in the show notes Jasmine Guillory has a new book Drunk on Love Kennedy Ryan Before I Let Go Amber D. Samuel The Many Dates of Indigo Kate Claiborne Georgie All Along Kylie Scott end of story. And all of them are really interesting. Some of them were new authors to me. Amber D. Samuel, her book, The Many Dates of Indigo, is being published by Wattpad. Have you heard of Wattpad? No, I had never heard of it either. And so I looked it up. 
And it's this new, new ish. I mean, at least new to me. It's wattpad.com and that's W A T T P A D. And it's a reading and writing social storytelling platform where people literally write books like they're writing it. It's in progress. So you can be a writer and you can be a reader on this platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can probably be both, but people watch and give them enthusiastic responses. And then as their popularity, I guess, grows, that's what gets them noticed. And then this young woman got published, Mm -hmm. which I think is so fascinating. So I don't know much about it. I know that it's a great way to develop a following. So any of you... Folks who are working on writing, maybe you want to check it out. I don't know what the benefit is to being a reader there. I mean, there's so much to read that I'm nervous even for myself to look at it, you know, but it sounds super cool. And it sounds like a way to not necessarily bypass the industry, but at least to have enthusiasm and maybe some version of accountability partners, accountability readers or something like that. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, so that part was really fascinating to hear them talk about that. So again, that's called wattpad.com. And I will list all of these authors and their book titles and the release dates Hmm. on our show notes. That's really kind of cool. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, how people really enjoy reading advanced reader copies, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm that when I was a bookseller, that was always one of the coolest things because new hires would always freak out. They're like, what? You could, (laughs) what? I still freak out about that. Yeah. And and so to read something that's in process, like that's being written, if you're like a super fan of a certain genre or a certain writer, I don't know if writers stay on there after they've published or It's a good question. But that would be a really interesting way to really engage with stuff that is beyond new. Right. Like it's, you know. And they have it separated by, like you can search by the genre And I also wonder what the software is like, you know, if there's a way that it's really helpful, something that you might not have access to otherwise. I I looked at it, but I didn't dig deep. Interesting. Did they talk about the fear of plagiarism or somebody stealing your ideas at all? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. I'm sure that'll happen in the future. (laughs) Who knows? Yeah, Yeah, it's super interesting. I want to learn more. And if any listeners, if any of you know anything about it already, please shoot us an email, inform us, yeah. cougars at gmail.com. Fascinating. Wow. And so now you also had a little bit of a road biblio adventure. I did. I did a very, as I've been saying, sassily, I drove 10 hours to take my son to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob was up north in Vermont for a week with the other side of his family, and he had a two-day time where he wasn't going to be with anyone. And so I drove up to Vermont to spend a little time with him and take him to the airport. It was lovely. I'm just being sassy, but I did not go to a bookstore. I did, however, go to a place called Uncommon Coffee in Essex, Vermont and walked up. There was a beautiful little free library that had been a Girl Scout project. It was really sweet filled with fun books, including Little Women, which I always like to see out in the wild. But then we open the door to this coffee place and it is decorated with books. There's a beautiful wall of books. There's books next to real plants, books on the table, like coffee table books on the table. And it was one of those that had regular tables and then couches and comfy chairs, beautiful coffee shop. And I was thrilled to see the book wall. That was my taste of books in Vermont. Uh, so cool. I mean, yeah. for one, the little free library is a pretty big one. Mm-hmm. And then the pictures you posted were just really cool of the inside. Yeah. If you get on any of our social media platforms, um, you'll see that I just posted some pictures. It was really fun. And Jacob had to get me to come back down to earth and order my breakfast. But the food and the coffee were also delicious, I have to say. Oh, that's wonderful. I was going to ask you how the coffee was. Delicious. And the whole back of it was this huge roasting facility, basically. And then they also had cool coffee, like those burlap coffee bags hanging from the ceiling. Nice. So it was all delicious. Yeah. No complaints. I love coffee (laughs) shops that do their own roasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good time. So again, that was uncommon coffee in Essex. 
So, which is a place I'd never been to. Also, I just happened. It's hard to find a place to stay in Vermont on very short notice in the summer. Yeah. So I stayed a little out of town from Burlington. Oh, okay. That's cool. I was going to ask you where it was in relation to Manchester, but I kind of know where Burlington is. Yeah, I was up by Burlington. Yes. Chris, do you have any upcoming jaunts? You know, I have two on my calendar and I'm not 100% I'll be able to attend, but I would love to go. um, Let's see. First up, August 8th at 6 p.m., the Savoy is hosting this event. It's actually virtual, so that would make it easier to get to. Dr. Mark Harper, who's the author of Chill, the Cold Water Swim Cure, is going to be doing a presentation and a QA. and a I'm really fascinated by the whole cold water swim cure. They say it can help with so many different things from depression and trauma, PTSD, physical things as well. I'm not great about extreme hot water or cold water. I mean, I did go into the water like in November when it was still, you know, the water was warm, the air was cold, but the water is still pretty warm in the sound at that time. I love cold water. I love it. (laughs) So I'm very curious about this. Yeah. I mean, I watched some videos about cold water swimming and like that some people, they do wear mittens and booties at least because it's your fingers Mm -hmm. and your hands that really can be painful when they get that cold. I mean, I know my, mine are, Yeah. um, but that your rest of the body can generally take it better than the extremities. Ooh, I hope you make it. I do too. Well, the fact that it's virtual, you know. And then the other event is August 12th, and this is a joint event, Bank Square Books in Savoy, along with the New London Day newspaper, are going to be hosting a conversation with Jamie Ford at the Westerly Library. Oh, I want to go. In Rhode Island, yes. Jamie Ford's new book is called The Many Daughters of Efong May, and he's going to be in conversation with Rick Coster. I started that book, like just the first page and then because I got the arc a long time ago and I need to go back to it. Yeah, it's about a woman who, I don't know if she goes back in time or researches some ancestors and from each generation learns things and that somebody's been looking for her in each Mm. generation, something like Mm. that. Yeah. So again, that's August 12th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. I believe that's a Friday. Okay. Yeah. And he's so, very funny and entertaining. Yeah. He's a nice man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about you? I have a very exciting upcoming adventure. I'm going to be going to Rockland, Maine to Barn Swallow Books for an all day workshop on August 8th with the authors Alyssa Altman and Catherine May. This is from 10 in the morning until 6 in the evening. The title of the day is Finding Comfort and Sustenance in Impossible Times. Mm-hmm. Reminder that Catherine May is the author of the book Wintering. Alyssa Altman is the author of the book Motherland. They're both authors of other books too, but those are books that I've talked about reading. And when I saw this, I was just so excited. So I have signed up. I'm going, I'm going to have a little retreat up there. And then on August 9th, they're both going to be there from five to seven at Barn Swallow Books doing a reading and a signing. So the event on August 8th does cost money. The event on August 9th is free, but there's space in both still. And Barn Swallow Books looks like this beautiful bookstore where they have a barn for special events in the back. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to spending time up there. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And that sounds really familiar. Hmm. Barn Swallow Books. Yeah, I've never been. I don't know much about Rockland, Maine, so I'm excited to go up there. If anyone lives in Maine and you want to join, (laughs) would love to meet you. Again, that's August 8th and 9th. Excellent. So what about upcoming reads? What's uh, on your list there? I have two that I'm excited about. One is called The Displacements by Bruce Holsinger. And our buddy Jana on all the social media platforms was like, drop everything, read this book. And when Jana speaks, I listen. So I'm looking to get myself a copy of that. And then we got an arc of a book that's super cool. It's called The Keeper. It's a graphic novel. 
The Keeper, Soccer Me, and the Law That Changed Women's Lives. The author is Kelsey Irvick. And this is in celebration and reference to the anniversary of Title IX. And she was a professional goalkeeper. I brought it up to Vermont with me. Jacob is a soccer player and he loved it and was dropping all kinds of hints that he didn't get through it and he would really <laughs> like to read it. And I said, sorry for your luck and took it back. <laughs> but maybe there's a copy in his future. And this comes out on September 20th. Oh, that sounds really cool. I'd like to check yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah, I will share it with nice. you, I promise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I plan on reading Mansfield Park by Jane Austen in August for Austin in August. And when this episode drops, it's August. So Yes. I think, what is it, <laughs> August 2nd or 3rd? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I will be reading Mansfield Park. I don't think I read it. I thought I'd read all of Jane Austen before. But when uh, Paul and Trevor were talking about it recently on an episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast... I was like, I don't know if I read that because like the conversation that they were having about the other novels made sense. But I was just like, that doesn't ring a mm. bell. So we'll see. Out now, reminder for folks, books that we've talked about on prior episodes that were not out yet. We want to remind you, Shudder by Ramona Emerson is out the day this episode airs. Oh my gosh. Second. You got to get this book and read it. Get it from the library. Buy it. We both love this one. Very much. As we were sitting down to talk, we realized we need to look at her upcoming events. Because even though we did get to see her in that great event that Soho invited us to, I'd love to hear her talk more about it. Yeah, absolutely. She's been posting a lot of fun stuff on her Facebook page, pre-signing copies and just all of the, the busyness that is, I guess, for all novels, but for a debut novelist, it's probably quite overwhelming. Yeah, I'm super excited for her. I hope the book does really well. That book's out from Soho Crime, reminder. Coming up, we have our conversation with Rachel Berenbaum, Atomic Anna. Such a good book. She's such a compelling person. She's a great friend to the book community. Reminder that she has, we're not sure what they call them, segments? Well, I think one of the places I just noticed recently, I think it might even be in the blurb, um, the author bio here. Well, I saw it somewhere called a podcast. I think people are using the term podcast really loosely because I've seen people who do stuff on YouTube calling it a podcast. Oh, okay. Anyway, A Mighty Blaze, it's video. At least that's how we've traditionally consumed it she is the debut author spotlight she does a great job and debut editor yes too. so yeah. check her out there and enjoy this conversation we sure did we're super excited to welcome back rachel Barenbaum. her new novel atomic anna is out now from grand central publishing atomic anna received starred reviews from publishers weekly and kirkus it was named a best book of the month by buzzfeed and was an apple books book of the month Emily was transfixed by the story, and I'm currently riveted to the audio version. Longtime listeners will remember we had the privilege of talking to Rachel on episode 102, and that was about her first novel, A Bend in the Stars. Since then, in addition to working on her intricately plotted and propulsive new novel, Rachel has been busy supporting others in the literary world. As part of A Mighty Blaze, she has interviewed countless authors and editors on Debut Spotlight and Debut Editor, both of which she founded. Rachel also writes book reviews and essays, which have appeared in places like The Daily Beast, Lit Hub, and LA Review of Books. After reading her recent essay in Harper's Bazaar called The Sports Bra Gave Us the Freedom to Compete, we both came close to ripping off our shirts and pumping our fists in the air in solidarity. Equality, like good sports bras and novels, makes the world a better place. Welcome back, Rachel. <laughs> Hello, thanks so much for having me. That was an amazing intro. Anytime we can talk about <laughs> equality, sports bras, and Chernobyl. I'm That's in. Right. Yes. <laughs> Covering all the bases here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Rachel, can you just quickly tell us what is Atomic Anna about? Sure. So it's about three generations of women who work together to build a time machine to stop Chernobyl and to save their family. So, so good. So succinct. Yes. 
<laughs> so, Gotta get that elevator pitch down, right? That's because right, people right. ask me that every day, all day. <laughs> and and I love it. And that sounds so straightforward, but the, the story is so much twistier than that. Yes. And so smart. And there's so much math and, oh, it's just great comic books. There's so much here to talk about. So let's get started. Thank the you. first thing that we wanted to talk to you about is just the structure. First of all, it's split into eight sections. Each section then has chapters with various character points of view. But you start the book with the idea of, and I think I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Perke Avat, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a set of moral teachings that's been handed down in the Jewish tradition over generations. And it's kind of foreboding because you say that it starts with talking about a warning, be patient in judgment. Yes. So Perke Avot is a um, very old traditional Jewish philosophical text, and it asks lots of big, heavy questions that you may be familiar with, questions such as, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And these are really big questions that I have always been fascinated with that really take up a lot of space in my brain. And, you know, when I think about books or anything really, right? If not me, then who? Who is going to do this? And I was very much driven by those questions and this text as I was writing Atomic Anna, because there are three generations of women in this book. There's grandmother, mother, and daughter. So we have Anna, Molly, and Raisa. They're all brilliant women, although they have struggles and it's difficult, right? But each generation is faced with, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? And it opens very specifically with Anna by accident. She travels through time um, in the very first scene. This is no secret, right? And she rips forward to the top of Mount Aragots. And while she's there, she finds her daughter, Molly, who's estranged at this point, and she's dying. Anna realizes in that moment, A, that she's created a time machine, <laughs> and B, she can use it to go back and either save her daughter or to save the hundreds of thousands, countless people who could die from the Chernobyl meltdown. And this is also another big philosophical moral dilemma. Do we save one person or the few, or do we save many, the millions? And yes, the answer seems obvious and simple, but I put forward in the book that when you are holding your daughter and she is dying in your arms and you have that choice, it is not simple and it is not that easy to choose that you want to save the millions, the many versus your single daughter. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That opening was so tremendous. I actually listened to it three times. Wow. Thank I, you. No, I just did. I just rewound back to the beginning and I, I was so time travel, you know, some people think of it as really just a sci-fi type thing, robots and spaceships or what have you. And your time travel story is so human. It's so about the love and connection between us and the struggles, the daily struggles, and then the, these huge struggles that you just talked about, like, how do you decide these things? It just feels so real to me, this novel. Thank you. I call it sci-fi light because there's time travel, right? But if you are a true sci-fi lover, right? And you love the, you know, the tropes and everything, it's not really in there. This is literary science fiction, literary time travel, like Time Traveler's Wife or Outlander, right? It's a way to go from one character in time to another, not to explore, right? The scientific machinations of how it happens. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Right? So, so we're pulled right away into this moment of the first jump in time to bring the generations together to, to realize that this is their journey. This is what they need to work on together. Yeah. And not to fangirl too hard on you, but like you Please. do, you do <laughs> make the science understandable, yes. you know, like it's just Thank that you, you don't go into these, you know, explicit details, but it's like, Oh, so that's why time travel could be possible because gravity bends light and, and all of these things that you also wrote about in your first novel, Bend in the Stars, which was, set in 1914. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I am pretty obsessed with Einstein and his studies of time. I don't study the equations. I want to be clear, right? Like the math part is not what interests me, nor do I understand it. But Einstein himself was questioning his entire career, what is time? Why does it matter? Why do we measure it? Because we made it up right? We agreed on minutes, days, hours, so that we could all be here today for this amazing podcast, but nothing else in the universe functions according to that clock that we observe. 
And Einstein really spent a lot of time thinking about that and working on it. You know, and came up with his theories that showed that time is relative. And you see that in the book. You see my obsession. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how did you take his quotes and his teachings and then fictionalize it? So he has a, one really famous line. I'm going to butcher it. It's something like only physicists like us understand that there's no difference between the past, the present and the future. And I love that idea because really it is taking into consideration this idea that time is relative. And he showed that if you could fast forward to or you know jump to the event horizon to the edge of a black hole, and stand there for what you would think was 10 minutes, and then jump back to Earth. You might have only experienced that jump as 10 minutes, but people on Earth might have experienced that time as 100 years, 200 years, right? So that is the example of how time is relative, right? It changes. And that's really where I start pulling those ideas in, that there is no such thing as absolute time. And if there's no absolute time, then we can jump around, right? And and that's where the novel sort of takes off from there. And that's about, I think, as heavy as the science gets. I mean, I explained some of the, a few more of the theories that go along with it, but really the ride is, let's dig into these lives of the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter, and see how you know, they came apart, how they're working to repair their lives and write their world and the universe around them. Yeah. I'm curious with the time travel piece too, when we spoke with you last, it was May of 2020. So it was when we thought, oh, this pandemic thing's not going to last very long. We're all going to be out of our houses soon. But you ended up writing an entire novel during a pandemic you know, some authors are going with, I'm going to write a pandemic novel, and that's going to be a character in the story. You did the opposite, right? You're in Chernobyl, you're in a different point in time, and you're traveling. Was that helpful to you to be able to do that? It was really helpful. So full disclosure, I had actually already sold a draft of the book. So I sold it in 2019. Um, And the real effect of the whole pandemic and the shutdown was my publication got pushed out a year, which was a lucky gift. At the time, I was upset. I wanted the book to come out. But I really used that extra, you know, 12 months to pull it together. And um, I have to say it was a real escape. I had sort of time travel in there by 2020, but I hadn't really used it as a way to explore the wounds, right, as a way to take us back to the way Anna's life began, right? So she starts in Russia at the revolution, and then she lives through to the rise of the Soviet Union, is shipped off to Berlin for a few years, back to the Soviet Union, right? It's sort of this sprawling life. And then her daughter is sent to America with her best friend and raised there. Her granddaughter, Raisa, also grows up in Philadelphia in America. Um, And then they all come back together on Mount Aragots. And so that arc, I was really able to pull out and expand and play with. And it was a great escape from being stuck in my house. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Now, for for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see what we're talking about, but we're going to put a clip of this on our YouTube channel. So do check it out. Rachel is sitting in front of some great blow up photographs of two things we would love for her to talk about kind of in the context of like, what was your research for the historical elements of this novel? Yes. So I love to talk about this part because I just find it fascinating. Like there's stuff, you know, sometimes there's stuff that you just can't make up. Right. (laughs) And so I figured if I was going to be writing a time travel story that starts in the Soviet union and comes to America right? How am I going to do that? Where is that going to take place? And there is some crazy stuff that the Soviets built. I mean, America too, during the Cold War, but, you know, to see it, it is now being documented and the pictures are coming out in one of the things that the Soviet Union built in what is now Armenia was a cosmic ray station on the top of Mount Aragats. And if you see this picture here right above me, this is the actual cosmic ray station that I talk about in the book. This is where Anna finds herself in the very first scene. This is where she spends her time building the machine. This is where her daughter Molly finds her and they ultimately reconcile and come back together. So uh, Toby Smith did a a huge um, photo essay for The Guardian, National Geographic. His pictures of the Cosmic Ray Station are published all over. I love them. I wrote to him to ask for permission to use them and he 
he gave it to me, which was amazing too. And you'll see the picture underneath here is this is the actual computers. This is what they were using in the book. This is what my character Anna was using um, to build her time machine. And these are the actual computers inside of the cosmic ray station that's above me here. It's pretty mm -hmm. wild. So very, cool. Very cool. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you can't make that stuff up. No, <laughs> no, no, but it does become its own character in the book. I mean, it's amazing how you pull it all together. The other thing we wanted to talk to you about is the audio book version. Mm -hmm. I consume this both with audio and print. And I have to admit over the course of the last week, I found every excuse I could to drive somewhere, walk somewhere, plug my ears in. Chris came up today and, and it's like a hundred degrees here. And she said yesterday she took a walk and she just kept walking. She didn't realize how long oh she was God. walking. <laughs> she was so hot. So did you have any part in deciding who was able to narrate the book? Yeah. So I'm glad that you guys love it. I also absolutely love how the audiobook turned out and hash that audio who did it. They're fantastic. So um, the process is that they send me a bunch of auditions. People are usually surprised to hear this, but yes, there are narrators who audition to read these books. So, um, and we knew we were going to do multiple narrators, multiple voices. So they sent me a whole bunch of auditions and I got to sit around and play them for my kids, right? I'd bring over friends. Which one do you like? You know, and I got to choose my top three and I would say, but I really love this one. <laughs> and then they chose the rest and they run with it. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a great production. It really is. I enjoyed it very much. And, you know, I did both because then I could do more hours in the day of reading. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. When I got back to my car yesterday, my face was as red as the cover of your book. Oh. <laughs> but I enjoyed every second of listening. So when we talked with you last time, the title of the book, the working title was A History of Time Travel, I believe. Yes. And now it's become Atomic Anna. And with this really cool cover, we'll share the cover everywhere, but it has triangles are a big theme on it. Can you talk a little bit about the symbology of the cover? Yeah, I mean, I think the cover is brilliant. I have to say it was one of the very first designs that I even saw that my editor sent. And I have this moment of that's it, that's it. And so it's red to be very Soviet and the, you know, the block sort of type is very Soviet and you see pieces of a woman because really we see pieces throughout the novel of Anna and Molly and Raisa. So they're all pieced together, taken apart and coming together at the end. Yeah, it's cool. beautiful. Yeah, and talk about the Soviets. You know, your research for that time period, like when Gorbachev was in charge of things, you know, here in the West, I mean, I remember Chernobyl being horrified by it and very frightened and the reaction here in the United States to that and the fears. Um, but then also this whole kind of love fest for Gorbachev that a lot of people here in the U S had, but you know, there's times when Anna's worried about his henchmen yeah. coming to get her. Can you talk a little bit maybe about the more recent research that you did on the Soviet Union? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always, I find that it's always easy to look back on the Soviet Union and Russia and sort of paint it as a much more beautiful place to live than it ever was, right? And when you think of the czar, the height of the czar is this romantic, right, marble, gilded age people, right? But, but you forget about the people who were starving and actually barely scraping by. And the Soviet Union also, it's easy to look back and say Gorbachev did these great things, but there were a lot of bad things that went along with it, including the Chernobyl meltdown. And so Anna is the chief engineer and she is in charge of it all. And it melts down, reactor number four melts down and she runs because she is afraid that she will be blamed. Because in the Soviet Union, there always had to be a scapegoat. So I read a lot about Chernobyl. Adam Higginbotham's book is amazing, Midnight at Chernobyl, right? These in the HBO series that came out, you know, inspired by that book and just lots of this research, a lot is now available publicly. It was, it was a very scary moment. At first, the Soviets wanted to cover everything up. Uh, they didn't even evacuate Pripyat, the closed city where everybody lived for a couple of days. Actually, children were outside playing in the ash that was raining down after the explosion, right? The mushroom cloud goes up, all the ash comes down, and mm -hmm. all those people, all those children were going to die very quickly and horribly. So it was tough. It was very sad to put those parts into, you know, to be researching that and writing it. But I really, it helped me really understand and dig into the relationships between grandmother, mother, and daughter, because 
when death is at your door, right? We often, or I, I don't know personally, but it seems that, right, uh, your family is what comes to the front. And so Anna is realizing she's probably going to die soon. And she's thinking back on her life and wants to find her, right, her daughter, her best friend, Yulia. She finds out she has a granddaughter. And that's really what I focus on, those ties between mother and daughter and grandmother. And also a mother that's a working mother and likes yes. being a scientist and likes her work and has a baby. And um, can you talk about that? I yes. Thought that thread was really important in the book. Thank you. Yes. So Anna's a very successful scientist. She absolutely loves her work. And I always thought as I was writing this, you know, if she were a man, everyone would forgive her and praise her for being so amazing. But because she is a woman and she has a child and she sees that as an interruption to her work, She's not as loved, right? Even at work itself, people are like, what's wrong with this woman that she doesn't want to take a maternity leave and be at home with her child? What's wrong with this woman that she doesn't want to spend more time, right, with her daughter? Instead, she only wants to come back to her office, to the lab, to keep working. And I really wanted to push that question because, what, like, not all women have to be mothers. And you can be a mother and still, right, put your career first. Why can't those roles be reversed? Why can't the husband be the one who's taking care or, you know, another partner be the one who's taking care of the child? And so I really wanted to put that to the front. I wanted her to be driven and career centric and to show that that's a beautiful way for a woman to live, right? That you can be a strong mother that way also. And similarly, the second generation, Molly, finds herself pregnant when she did not expect it. And she's not sure she wants to be a mother either. And yet that contrasts with Yulia, who is Anna's best friend, who ultimately adopts Anna's daughter, Molly, and raises Molly's daughter, Raisa. And Yulia only wanted children, right? She, she wanted more and more children, right? She dreams of children and she can't have any of her own. And so there's a lot of conversation around what it means to be a mother, what it means to want career and or children. And I love hearing the conversations in book clubs, right? And emails from people talking about that and, you know, that juxtaposition that's in the novel. Yeah, that's great. Can we also talk about comic books? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I would love to talk about comic books. Um, so Molly, who's the middle generation growing up in America, she is growing up in the heyday of comic books and also second wave feminism. And, you know, in this time period, women were pushing their roles, just like Anna was pushing to work, right? There are these questions of can't women be working? Women don't have to be in the home. And she comes across comic books and realizes women don't have to be in refrigerators because literally every comic book drawn back then had women being thrown into refrigerators and fighting over men. And she finds a couple where women are actually coming out and fighting and they're strong. And she says, this is what I want to draw. This is what I want the world to be. And so she is an artist. Truly, she sees the world as, you know, light and dark and shadows. And she wants to draw and she wants to draw comics to tell her story. Uh, later on, we see that they're used to communicate between Anna and Raisa, but that's really where her passion falls. And she sadly falls to drugs, addiction. She finds herself in jail, so she loses her daughter. But that through line about comics is just, it was super fun to write. Trina Robbins was one of the women at the forefront of the comics movement with an X, C-O-M-I-X, and pushing to recast women in, literally in pictures, in drawings, as strong and independent, right? And not just huge boobs and tiny waists, but as women. And so I give her a big role in this book and uh, actually got in touch with Trina Robbins and oh. sent her a copy of the book. And that was amazing. She wrote back saying she loved it. So that was pretty awesome. Oh, that's great. And did you go out and read some old comic books too? Yeah. As research? Yes, yeah. Yes. I mean, I had read them before a long time ago. So I sort of went back to them to remember, right? Because this was, you know, as a, as a little girl, this is where I could see strong women, like literally physically strong women picking up the refrigerators and smashing them. And uh, <laughs> So I just loved that. And I put that in there. That's great. Well, we also really appreciate your advocacy for your daughters as an athlete, as a young girl and her sports teams that she's on. You talk about that in um, the sports bra article 
And taking a turn away from novel writing, mm -hmm. we noticed that you're also getting involved in local politics. And <laughs> we're wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. <laughs> I am. So aside from Atomic Anna, I did have this great opportunity to write about the anniversary of the sports bra on Title IX, which thank you guys for reading. I absolutely love that essay that was in Harper's Bazaar. I've been coaching her teams. This year I coached basketball for the first time. And, you know, there are lots of teams that my daughter plays on that are dominated by women with amazing sports resumes, but basketball is not one of them. And I'm just standing in the gym as the only woman, right? Aside from these 10, 13 year old girls and just thinking we have come too far for this. And I am someone who believes strongly that you can't just say you're upset with it. You need to get up and do something, right? If not me, then who? <laughs> if not now, then when? <laughs> so there I am coaching basketball and similarly getting involved in local politics. So I'm an elected member of the Brookline Town Meeting. We uh, go through lots of issues like this and hopefully making a difference out there. Yeah. It is not a full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that the novel is political, you know, and mm -hmm. um, it's great also that we're living in a really tricky time. I mean, I think everyone's probably said that in the time they live in, it can feel a little bit hopeless. And I think to get involved in your local politics I don't mean to speak for you, but I would think that that would make you feel like you're doing something. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's exactly why I did it. I mean, I want to fight for, for example, how accessible is abortion and information on abortion here in Brookline, Massachusetts, where I live. And how are we going to, you know, deal with the so-called crisis pregnancy centers that want to pop up? Um, I mean, I'm literally on zoning boards, right? I can vote on whether or not to allow these things in my neighborhood. So that is a powerful thing. And I don't take it lightly. It's an honor that I was elected to do this, just as I take it as an honor to be involved in the sports teams, right? And to be raising strong girls, because I just want it to be even better for the next generation, right? I'm so grateful for all that the women have done that came before me. And I just want to keep it going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and how much, you know, talking about Title IX, like how much, how much, this might just be an obvious, you know, question, but how much did growing up playing sports impact you and, and where you are now, like that competitive spirit nurtured through sports? Yeah. I mean, I am a huge fan of sports for all kids because I think one of the most important things you can learn from sports is that you will fall down and miss the ball or whatever, right? Have a terrible time all the time. And you have to get back up every time, right? Even baseball player, you get strikes all the time, right? I played squash, you know, you miss the serve all the time, you lose points all the time, played field hockey, right? Like all these sports just teach you to fall down and get up, fall down and get up, miss and get up. And I think that is a valuable lifelong lesson. And particularly for girls, um, we don't always have a place where we can just go out and be just run for that ball, right? And don't hold back and let it all go. Because I think a lot of girls, I mean, I certainly saw it growing up, you're taught to be, you know, quiet and sit there neatly and have everything together. But when you are on a sports field, you can let it all go. So, and take space. You know, we're yeah. taught not to take space, right? But exactly. That's what you're yeah. supposed to do is take space. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. you're even better if you take up more right. space. <laughs> right. so, exactly. so I love it. And I talk about how, you know, when I was playing sports, there were only, you know, a couple of champions, like women who had come before me. And I was on that sort of the tail end of the first wave of women coming through as varsity uh, D1 athletes in college. But, you know, it, I, I felt so lucky to have it, even though we had tiny, horrible locker rooms, right. and tiny, horrible weight rooms. <laughs> and bad bras. Still have. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, my kids can't believe that I played sports in like kilts and little skirts, right? Yeah. <laughs> but those were my uniforms. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And, you know, women were still battling that in the most recent Olympics. So, yeah, with their tiny know. bikinis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, Rachel, are we allowed to ask you what you're working on now? Uh, I will be a scholar in residence at Brandeis this fall, and I'm working on a collection of short stories called Lady Killers. Mm -hmm. and ten, I don't know, maybe you'll ask me, hopefully I'll come back on your show and you'll tell me the old title was, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for now it's Lady Killers and it's about um, five real life women who were assassins plotting against the czar in Russia around the turn of the century and the end of the 1800s who were ultimately successful. 
in killing him. So history does not record the work that these women did and my short story as well. So oh, that's what it's about. I can't wait that for that. That sounds so good. Thank you. Get busy. Yes. Get working. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be at the Hadassah Brandeis uh, Institute at Brandeis, and I even get some research assistants to wow. help me. So that's a pretty wow. amazing thing. Yeah. That is cool. Congratulations. Wow. That's great. We will be standing by kind of patiently. <laughs> kind of. <yes. laughs> See if it's still called Lady Killers, because it's like yeah. the title. <laughs> Oh, Rachel, yeah. thank you so much for the amazing book. Uh, really, really just enjoyed it so much. And thank you for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. It's always such a pleasure. Chris, Emily, thank you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from Libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.